Ich weiß nicht, ich weiß nicht, ich weiß nicht. Yes, there we are. Okay. Okay, hi. Um, thank you very much, Zach. And uh, I, I'd like, as always, I'd like to thank the organizers um, for putting together this beautiful meeting, especially this time because they were very uh, flexible in allowing me to, to switch the slot and give this last presentation today. Um, and also apologies for keeping you longer, but uh, I, I hope we can still get to dinner in time. All right. So um, I'm uh, Johannes. I'm going to talk about um, basically chemical machine learning for molecular systems, and uh, we're also interested in materials. And the twists of, of what I'm going to do is that we um, are mostly using um, energy functions to predict the properties. So we are using energy functions to predict the energy and the forces, but also to predict uh, other properties like dipole moments and densities. Uh, and uh, I'll explain to you why. Um, but before that, a quick recap of something that, that we've seen a lot um, already, which is the, the representation problem of um, uh, chemical machine learning. So in particular, if you're doing the kind of uh, chemical machine learning where you are predicting properties of, of three-dimensional uh, chemical structures, um, you have to represent that 3D structure in some machine-readable form. Um, and there's, as you know, a big, ah, there it is, big list of things you can do to, to this end. Uh, I think the symmetry functions were one of the first uh, um, things in that direction. Um, uh, we are also part of the SOAP family. So, so this is what we mostly use, but um, as we've seen, I think the, this is quite quite uh, interesting that, that uh, these different approaches are now converging to a, to, to a kind of related family of, of, of things. And that in my view, there's not a big difference uh, in, in what you can do. Um, and the basic reason why these things work is because they, uh, they allow us to uh, quantify similarity in chemical space. Um, and and a, a nice way to visualize this is using these, these KPCA maps. I think you've seen something like this um, as well before. So this is a kernel principle component an analysis where essentially the, the distance between two points in this uh, plot, each point representing one of the Q9 molecules is related to how similar you know, our representations and our kernel thinks they are. Um, and uh, this is all well and good, but the, the real um, uh, kicker is that um, if we then color these maps with some uh, chemical properties, these tend to be smoothly distributed across these maps. Uh, and this means that then we can use this similarity essentially to interpolate between different systems. We don't need to run 100,000 DFT calculations typically. We just need some representative samples and a way of basically, um, uh, yeah, in, uh, interpolating between them. Okay, so, um, one thing that has also come, come out of this kind of convergence of different representation um, uh, styles is that it's usually advantageous to encode the, the, the system in terms of uh, atomic environments. Um, uh, or as we've seen now also maybe um, uh, atom pairs, but anyways, local sort of features. Um, and this is, this is good because it, makes, uh, it reduces the, the computational cost. It means that inference can, can be parallelized very easily for very large systems. Um, and it's also good because it's, um, it's an, an inductive bias. It's smart to do this because indeed um, uh, chemical properties are, uh, and also atomic interactions are somewhat short ranged and things that are close to each other are really um, dominate the, 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 the properties of a, of a system very much. Um, but of course, it means that we are neglecting long range things. Now, um, if we are doing something a little bit more, more fancy and we're doing message passing neural networks, um, this to some extent um, overcomes this limitation because we are now including information from beyond the cutoff. But I would argue that this is actually not a very elegant way of including long range information um, because it's a very convoluted way of doing it. Um, and also it's ultimately limited, right? So you can do six or eight message passing steps and this will get you some ways further. And for many of these small molecule data sets that, that we're using, ultimately this, this means that you are almost using a global description. Um, but in reality, if I'm interested in, in materials and we've seen you know, uh, this, what was it, a 500 billion atom simulation by, by, by Borders yesterday, um, then no message passing will ever get you into the real long range. And of course, also not for periodic systems. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the thing that, um, uh, that I'm interested in, so this long range issue. And uh, there are some, some uh, like uh, I have to mention here, so some, some more physically inspired things like uh, FISNET and SpookyNet are also um, uh, things that Jörg Bela um, and, and Stefan Gödeke have been doing. 
um, that, 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 um, that do this in a more physically um, reasonable way. And this is kind of the tradition that I'm also following here. Okay, so um, just a brief, um, to give you an idea of the kinds of systems we, we, we want to study and, and that we do study. So we, we saw the, the crystal structure prediction problem uh, by, by in Andrea's talk. So this is something that we've been working on uh, um, and, and that is very, very interesting and challenging um, because of, of basically the big size of these unit cells and the, the large landscape of, of different uh, polymorphs that you need to um, scan. So machine learning is a, is a real, has a real um, uh, big benefit here. Um, you know, we use it for molecular design of electronic properties. This, is, this was mainly focused on um, organic semiconductors. Um, and um, we've also, I also have such a nice picture, Nuria, as you do, <laughs> of a reaction network. So, so I, I think this is also very interesting because um, if you do catalysis, you do, um, you know, the kind of process that has a, a many intermediates, um, you need to do something to, um, to tackle the, the number of transition states that, that you're interested in. And um, this doesn't mean that you need to predict all of them, but you need to know which ones are the important ones. And this is, I think, also a challenge where um, this kind of ML can, can help a lot. Um, and in particular of, of relevance for this talk is that we, we uh, study a lot of um, energy materials, right? So, so uh, again, catalysts, also um, battery materials, um, electrolytes for other per, uh, applications. Um, and those tend to be polar, right? And, and um, kind of the longest range interaction that, that is typically there in uh, chemistry and, and physics is um, electrostatics, right? It decays as one over R. So if you have a polar material and you use a, a short range representation, you are neglecting something. It may or may not be important, but it's, you're definitely neglecting something. Yeah, there's something there. So this is, for example, an example of um, uh, these uh, iridium oxide catalysts um, uh, and the interfaces there or um, yeah, solid state electrolytes, lithium diffusion in these ionic materials. Um, and it turns out that it, it, we don't always end up using long range models to, to do this, but, but we, we do always check whether they are necessary or not. And, and this is kind of, I guess the take home message there. So it, it, it really depends on what you're modeling and that sometimes the local models or very often the, the local models end up surprising you and the, the long range electrostatics really doesn't affect the property you're interested in. So for um, the, these uh, solid state electrolytes, it turns out the lithium diff diffusion, um, uh, the mobility of the lithium atoms in these electrolytes is not really affected by long range um, interactions. It doesn't matter to the mobility if you include them or not. Um, but if you, of course, if you have charge defects, if you have applied fields, the story changes and you need to uh, take these things into account. Um, okay, so this was kind of, you know, my, my, my bragging thing. I showed you a bunch of projects that we're working on. Um, and and um, that where we use machine learning, um, but this is not to say that this is always easy or without problems. And kind of my my so my now uh, um, negative slide, let's say, is about all, all of these problems. So, um, for example, we saw in, in in Andrea's talk that there can be natural um, limitations to how much data you you can generate or to how economical it is to generate the data. So sometimes the training costs can simply outweigh the benefits because you um, cannot afford to. Where is the, ah, yeah, okay. Um, you, you cannot afford to run all these um, uh, DFT calculations. It's just not worth it. Uh, transferability is always a huge issue. Um, so what happens if I do some predictions outside of my training set? Will I even know that I'm outside of the scope? Um, and then, yeah, the locality I already mentioned. And kind of the canonical way of addressing these problems, um, other than just throwing a lot of data at the problem and a lot of compute, is to introduce physics into, into the, the interior model somehow, right? So we have this kind of transparent uh, box of physics around the black box of machine learning, um, hoping that we understand a little bit about the physics, definitely more than about the machine learning in my case. So anyways, what does that mean? What, 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 uh, what, what, what does it mean to include physics? So this has been done always because you know, people are not stupid. Of course, it's a very obvious idea to do this. Um, so of course, all these invariances that we've been hearing about symmetries, these are fundamental, and it's a fundamentally good idea to include them. Um, of course, the degree to which it's necessary depends a little bit, but, but uh, I think this, this has been really, a, uh, I think having representations that, that, that um, obey these um, uh, symmetries and variances, also size extensivity, by the way, a big, big uh, and very important issue. Uh, I think this has made um, chemical machine learning possible and, and applicable and useful. If you don't do this, I think um, it, it is very risky that, that your model will uh, do things, do unexpected things. Um, 
And in particular, something that I'm very interested about, and uh, I guess we've also heard about neural DFT, so that I'm very curious about what, what Microsoft Research will do in this direction, um, is to include electronic structure information uh, in some way. And this is what I will talk about now for the rest of, uh, of my talk. Okay, so um, in um, building these representations, we usually start from these, these machine learning representations, we usually start from this neighborhood density. Um, and, and now the question is, how do we get from the neighborhood density to the electron density? Um, and why do I care about the electron density? Because it's, to me, the kind of the fundamental property. It, it's by itself interesting, of course, you can get um, electrostatic potentials, dipole moments that are important, you know, for um, uh, long range interactions. Um, uh, you can get some interesting derived properties if you can do the response of the density to some perturbations. Um, and of course, through DFT, we can get en energies and forces that have the correct asymptotics. So, and, and that's what I'm after in, in many of these cases, because ultimately what, uh, what we are doing 90% of the time is building some sort of interatomic potential. And there's a very nice work um, from, from the Chelyotic group in this direction already on, on kind of predicting the electron density. Um, and, and this is a very um, uh, nice trick in a way because they decompose the density into local contributions and then use SOAP descriptors essentially, so the, the, the neighborhood density um, to predict what the electron density around that center looks like. And this works very nice. Um, and, and you get this, the full electron density in a localized basis. Um, but of course, in, if, if your system is somehow inhomogeneous and there are no local effects in, in particular, if, if there's charge transfer, so you have you know, regions of different electronegativity in your system, and there's some charge flowing from here to there, um, then uh, this model has no way of knowing about this. And, and this can be an issue. Um, and also, of course, if you do this, there's no automatic conservation of charge. In practice, that's, I'm told, not a big problem. So these things kind of learn to conserve charge reasonably well. But again, I think this only works for um, homogeneous systems. And if your system is inhomogeneous um, and it has different, you know, if it's supposed to be um, negatively charged in one place and positively charged in the other place, um, these models will not, will not get this right. Um, so what is the, the better way, in my view, of doing this for, for the purposes of, um, of predicting energies and forces? It's to go through density functional theory. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the typical um, uh, DFT uh, equation. So energy is a functional of the electron density. And it has uh, this kinetic energy contribution. It has the external potential, which in the simplest case is the interaction of the density with the, uh, uh, with the nuclei of the atoms. Um, it has the Hartree energy, which is kind of this classical self energy of the, of, the, of the density. And it has the exchange correlation contribution. Um, and there's kind of, in my view, two um, niches or two domains where, where machine learning can be really useful. So one is uh, in, in, in basically building kinetic energy functionals. Um, this is because kinetic energy functions are notoriously difficult to build. So there is no, um, uh, the, the, no universally applicable kinetic energy functions, basically. There are ones that are quite inaccurate and there are ones that are accurate, but you cannot run them self-consistently. Um, and, and hence they are kind of useless for simulations. Um, and uh, there has been some, some really interesting work by Kieran Burke and also by Isaac Tamblin in this direction uh, in, in uh, building really powerful non-local kinetic energy functions. And the other big one is, is the one that everyone knows. So if you, if you decide to, you're, you don't wanna bother with kinetic energy and you do Koncham DFT um, so that you get you know, the bulk of the kinetic energy from, from your orbitals, um, then you can do um, uh, focus on the exchange and correlation, which are the, the remaining um, unknowns in this, in this whole thing. Um, and this potentially gets you improved on local functionals. And we also found that actually you can, you can um, make, make functionals cheaper in this way, which is nice. So this is actually what, we, what I'm gonna talk about, but this is also very interesting and um, uh, also something that, that I think is worth pursuing. Um, okay, so if we, if we want to then address this problem and I'm gonna start by talking about the correlation energy itself uh, first, because the correlation energy is, well, first of all, it's the, the, the smallest part of the total energy. So it's you know, making our lives a little easy in that sense because it's, you know, we're, we have 99% of the energy uh, taken care of and we're just predicting that, that final missing 1%. Uh, but it's also the most expensive part to, to calculate exactly. It's almost impossible to, to calculate exactly for most systems, right? So this is why, of course, it's a, it's a very worthy target for machine learning because we can, if we can get a good approximation to it, um, we save a lot of CPU time. And this is typically uh, calculated uh, using an integral, right? So you basically, you have a, um, a grid around your molecule 
And for each grid point here, you calculate this energy density epsilon, um, uh, which somehow depends on the density. And usually it depends on the density in a very simple way. It depends uh, on the density, just uh, taking the, the, the local density and its gradients and maybe the kinetic energy density into account. Um, right. And so basically you're doing numerical quadrature, you're running over this grid and summing up the, the, these energy densities. Um, and that's kind of the natural target then for our, um, for our machine learning approach. And this is actually also what, what Borders briefly talked about in his talk yesterday. Um, uh, so the nice thing about using this density is that it's, um, well, it's reasonably efficient to calculate this integral. Um, it's already implemented in all of the codes, uh, right? So that you don't have to worry about the, the grid and the quadrature. Um, but kind of this, this, the simple relationship between the density and, and the energy density is what, what causes the problems of normal DFT approximations. Um, so do, making this not local as Boris showed is, is a good idea, um, but there are some, some issues here. And, and the issues that, that, that we found is that um, it's a little bit hard to infer this energy density because it's not really a physical quantity. Um, so what is a sort of a, a physical observable that you can get from a quantum mechanical calculation um, is the correlation energy itself. But this, this density here is, is not really defined. So in, in fact, any density that integrates to the right correlation energy is as good as any other in, in some sense. Um, so this makes this problem a little bit ill-defined, right? We have uh, for each molecular configuration, we have one um, correlation energy point, but we have uh, 10,000 uh, grid points where we want to infer the density. Um, so this makes the learning a little bit tricky. Um, so what we ended up doing was um, we took a couple cluster calculations. So couple cluster um, is, is one, one of the kind of gold standard methods of, of calculating the correlation energy from a wave function. Um, and we modified this uh, so that it projects the couple cluster energy onto the, the grid of the density, right? So this is kind of a, an unambiguous procedure to, um, to do this uh, um, a projection and at first glance, you know, so this is the simplest system, but it's it's a good place to start. The H2 molecule, um, if you look at this, the electron density here and the correlation energy density that we get from this procedure, this looks kind of good because the correlation energy density, um, as you can see, it's it's negative or zero or everywhere, right, which is, makes sense because the correlation energy is supposed to be a negative number. Um, and it kind of uh, mirrors the electron density. And this is important because we are trying to build a map from here to here. So if there's a kind of a, if, if these two things are similar, this makes building that map easy. Um, but it turns out that if you then go out of equilibrium and you go to this, um, uh, for example, stretched um, uh, H2, this is a notorious case of, of static correlation, of strong correlation, um, then this whole thing is not, not so attractive anymore. So here's the correlation energy density. Um, now suddenly it has a big uh, positive peak in the middle. And so that's, not nice, but what is worse is that um, the, this peak is at a place where the electron density is basically zero. Um, and this makes it then extremely non-local. It makes it extremely hard to, to build a map from here to here. Um, and yeah, so this was kind of where, where we got stuck. Um, and it, it turns out that, that essentially building, using this projection um, is not really a good idea. So we were able to do some, some useful stuff using mononuclear systems that don't have the static uh, correlation problem. Um, and, but, but then the problem is so easy that you don't need machine learning to solve it. So we ended up building kind of normal GGA functions and that was kind of interesting and fun, but it didn't really get us where we wanted to be. Um, and I, I guess the lesson that we learned from this and actually um, uh, when I tell this then people tell me, yeah, I could have told you that before, but I had to learn this way, um, is that kind of this predefining of the partitioning of the energy by, by projecting the energy onto the grid is not a good idea because we are um, taking away a lot of freedom from the ML potential, uh, from the ML method to, to find an, the optimal partitioning, right? Um, so we are actually making it harder to learn by, by doing this, this projection, contrary to what we, are, we were actually intending to do. Um, okay, but we still have that mismatch problem, right? We still have so many grid points and only uh, so few uh, reference data uh, per system. Um, so what we kind of figured uh, as a next step is we just need a more efficient representation of the electron density than this real space grid. So this, the grid is the problem, so let's get rid of the grid. Um, and what, what we ended up doing actually was then uh, go back to the work of, of Michele Cerioti that I mentioned about predicting the density and just reworking that. So 
the, the, the neat thing about uh, the, the density prediction work was that they used basically um, uh, localized basis functions, atom-centered basis functions, and they were predicting the coefficients of those basis functions. Um, and that means that the information about the density is basically in those coefficients. So we can revert that process. We can take the density, we can fit it with the, with the localized basis, and then build our functional based on those coefficients. Um, so this is kind of illustrated here. So the, 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 the kind of normal Contran way of representing the density is based on, on products of, of basis functions. And this is not a good representation for us because uh, these, these products of basis functions are, uh, they are delocalized, they're not atom centered, and they can change as the geometry changes. But if you use density fitting, so you use atom centered basis functions to do this, um, uh, you don't have any of these problems. The, the basis set is always constant and fixed. The shape of the basis function doesn't change if the geometry changes. So this is a really robust and efficient um, uh, way to represent the, um, the density. And then uh, kind of a, a bonus that you get is that, of course, since your basis functions are atom-centered, um, this, this partitioning, you, you kind of naturally partition the density into uh, atomic contributions. But note, we are partitioning the density, but not the energy density. And that's the big, uh, big difference here. Uh, and then you get these nice kind of uh, pockets of electron density corresponding to each atom that sum up to the total density. Okay, so the, the, the last problem we have when we use these coefficients is that they're not rotationally invariant, of course. So if I, if I rotate my molecule, then those density fitting coefficients um, uh, change. Um, but, but this is, of course, the same problem that you have when you do uh, SOAP or any other um, uh, you know, a neighborhood density-based representation. And so we can solve it in the same way. And, and, and in this case, we just did the rotationally invariant uh, power spectrum trick. Um, and then basically you're done. You can just look at the, you know, uh, SOAP paper from, from 2010 and copy exactly what they did. So you, you can build a kernel um, that, that now measures the similarity, not between atomic environments, but between um, atomic electron densities. Um, and you can then build a, a size extensive machine learning model based on these atomic densities, but it is like, it is a pure uh, density function. I have to be, be very clear about this. So the only thing that enters um, this, this expression is the um, uh, electron density. Of course, we, are, we do some things with the electron density, but it only depends on the electron density. Um, and it works. So we can do, you know, we applied this for some, some, some simple uh, toy models to kind of, you know, check whether we can, we can cover different chemistries. So this is a, water clusters, protonated water clusters, and uh, these alkane molecules. Um, we basically generated a, a little bit of um, uh, molecular dynamics data, and then we're kind of predicting basically future um, uh, MD steps based on a part of the trajectory. Um, so this works very well, and it's also transferable. Um, so the, the, the nice thing, again, about working with the correlation energy is that it is fairly local and, and um, in, in that sense, short range. And all of the long range stuff, we do exactly anyways, because we're exactly computing um, the Hartree potential and, uh, and the external potential. Um, so we can train on you know, four water molecules, predict for eight water molecules, or we train on small alkanes and predict for octane, and that works quite well. Okay, um, but so far, everything I showed you was non-self-consistent. And, and this is of course um, a little bit of a, of a downside. Um, so this means we were running essentially hartree fock calculations to get the electron density and, and all of the other energy components first. And then we were using the hartree fock density to predict the couple cluster correlation energy. Um, what would be nice, of course, if, if we didn't have to do the hartree fock calculation to begin with, um, and there's in principle no, no, no need for it because we have a density function so we can run the calculations self consistently um, in principle. But if we do this, um, it doesn't really work. Uh, and the reason is that we've, we've been training on physical hartree fock densities, um, and then we do the self-consistency, uh, and the self-consistency basically now goes to what our functional thinks is the minimum, but our function has no idea about any, you know, about the whole density landscape. It doesn't know that unphysical densities are unphysical, um, so that's what you get when you do self-consistent uh, training. This was actually also uh, already observed by, by, by uh, Klaus Robert Müller and Kieran Burke when they did this um, orbital 3 DFT work. Um, and they, they explained this like this, that essentially the, the, the training densities you have, they are kind of lie on a manifold uh, in this space of possible densities. Um, and then you, you, you train on, on, on things in that manifold. Um, but when you minimize the energy of your new functional, um, the, the functional will just run away from that manifold into regions that are completely unphysical and where there is no training data. Okay, so um, the way we can solve this 
uh, is, is quite simple. It's the same way you solve uh, it for interatomic potentials to some extent. We can do iterative training. Um, and so this is a very simple illustration of this, um, but I like it because you can really see this, this, this manifold that uh, Kieran Burke was talking about. Um, so basically now we are doing exact exchange and MP2 correlation as our targets. So a, a combined exchange correlation functional um, and we do self-consistent calculations. And here, this is a, a principal component analysis of all the densities uh, for, for the CO molecule as we stretch it and, and, and push it together. Um, and you can see that yeah, all the physical densities for training and test set lie on this manifold and the SCF densities we predict are down here, completely removed. And if you look at the density um, error of, of this method, it's huge, so very, very unphysical densities. Uh, so these are density difference plots for um, uh, our target, MP2 in this case, um, and the machine learning model. And just to compare, this is the Hartree Fock density and the PBU zero density to, to give you an idea of you know, how big those errors are. Um, but then we add basically some of these densities here to the training set, we retrain. Um, and you can see that as we do this, our SCF points, really do approach the manifold of, of physical densities. And after some iterations, um, we get a really good prediction of the, um, uh, of the density from this. Um, and this is, this is fun. CO is a very fun example because um, the, it's well known that the dipole moment of, of CO is actually wrongly predicted by the Hartree-Fock method. So this means that the correct dipole moment is a, is a correlation effect. And we are here training in, um, a density function on exact exchange and MP2 correlation. Um, and, and this is not, not so easy because the MP2 correlation is a smaller part. It's like 10% of the, the exchange energy. Uh, but nonetheless, we are fitting it well enough to, to, to even reproduce this, um, this correlation effect in the density. Um, so that was very nice. Um, and it also works for, for things that are a little bit more complicated. Uh, uh, so we did here the water dimer. We're currently working on, on scaling this up um, uh, from, from our prototype code to get some more uh, um, uh, you know, complex systems working, but in principle, it works quite well. Although, so there's a, a big caveat here. We are doing a, a kind of indirect thing here, of course. We are learning that we're, we are predicting the density. We're looking at the density predictions, um, but we're not training on the densities. The densities don't go into the loss function at all. It's all energy. And it turns out there are some density errors that persist that simply don't affect the energy very much and we cannot get rid of those. So the densities we get um, are sometimes very good, sometimes not so good. The energies are consistently quite good. So this is kind of the, the caveat here. Um, in principle, this can be just expanded by including density information to the loss function as well. But this is just um, important to mention that it's, it's not enough to just use the energy um, for all purposes. Okay. How much time do I have? Five minutes, okay. Ten minutes. Okay, good. So, um, good. So that was all, all of the DFT stuff. So uh, uh, the the last couple of minutes I want to use um, to talk about a very related project. Um, and the, the the question here is, um, when we do this, um, this this kernel DFT stuff, we are still doing you know basically a full DFT calculation. So the, our our uh, reason for 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 this you know our justification for this is that we can do higher accuracies, but we're not really making things very much faster. Um, so, and, and this can be limiting, right? You know, it, it means that we cannot do a, a million uh, um, uh, atom systems and, and all that. Um, but the question is, do we really always need the full density to get these long range effects correctly? And the answer is, is basically no. Um, so we, we, we've been developing something, something related uh, that is very much in the same vein. Um, but that is not predicting the full density. So something very simple that you can do, and that is also commonly done in, um, uh, for example, density functional type binding and, and related methods, is that you can take the, the electron density and you can partition it into some uh, reference density and a, a density fluctuation term. And this reference de density, this is very often kind of the spherical, um, uh, spherically average neutral atom densities, right? Um, and so here I have a, a very simple illustration of acetylene uh, in, in 1D. And then as you add these, this reference density, this basically gets you kind of peaks where the peaks need to be and they're approximately of the, of the correct height. But what is missing is the density fluctuation. So basically there will be charge transfer within the molecule, polarization within the molecule, and that's not, not, not well described by this reference. So that's what the fluctuation is for. And then we, we kind of describe the final um, density in terms of a sum of Row zero and and 
um, and this fluctuation. And as it turns out, you can use a very simple ansatz for this um, fluctuation density. So basically, if you also use spherical basis functions for that, so just spherical Gaussians, um, you already get a pretty reasonable description of, of what the density distribution in the molecule looks like. Um, because basically now you're fixing the main problem of the reference density. So wherever it was too high, you make it a little bit lower. Wherever it was too low, you make it a little bit higher. Um, there are some details here in the density. So this, this dashed line would be this um, approximate density. Uh, for example, if there's some, some polarization between two atoms, um, uh, this is of course not captured. Um, but, but by and large, the, the, the electron distribution within a molecule can be, can be approximated quite well. Um, and the good thing about using these spherical basis functions and their coefficients is that essentially this then is just a problem of finding partial charges. So very simple way of representing the density. Um, and then uh, we just need an energy functional that works with partial charges. And, and this has been well known for a long time. Um, so this is, uh, for example, this, this QEQ method. There are also other related ones. Um, and these methods are, are charge equilibration methods. So they basically describe how charges uh, are transferred within a molecule. Um, based on uh, the electronegativity, he and the hardness of, of each element. And th they work quite well, but of course they are pretty coarse approximations. And the reason why they are somewhat coarse and not, not so as flexible as we would like them to be is because of course the, the electronegativity and the hardness of an atom are not a, an, a constant. So the, the, the electronegativity of an atom in a molecule depends on its environment. Um, but we know how to include environmental information from, for example, soap. Um, so that's what, what we did here, okay? So the, the idea is basically you, you, instead of having a constant electronegativity for each atom, you now have uh, electronegativity that depends on its environment um, uh, as described by the SOAP descriptor. And then it's again, a, a simple kernel rich regression model basically. Um, and we trained this uh, for the first application on, on uh, the dipole moments of QM9 molecules, works very well there. So this is a, a learning curve for different uh, uh, soap cutoffs, basically, it's not so important. Uh, the important thing is that you see that basically adding this environment dependence, so from QEQ, which is the constant electronegativity, to KQEQ, which has the kernel-based uh, environment information, is a big improvement. Um, and it's also a big improvement over, over other machine learning models, and it's kind of on par with uh, the, this new ML model, which has a somewhat more sophisticated um, way of describing the density because it uses local dipoles to, to basically uh, construct it. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this. Um, but just a very brief uh, outlook um, on, on where we're going with this um, uh, KQQ stuff. So we're now also applying the energy function to, to get energies. Um, and and this, this has been very prom promising. Um, so one key thing here is that, that we need to combine it with a normal uh, potential as well, because the KQQ energy is only a part of the total energy, it's only kind of the electrostatic part of the energy. Um, and again, it's, uh, the, the, the problem is one of, of, of partitioning the, the kind of electrostatic and non-electrostatic contributions to the energy. Um, but one way to solve this is essentially to fit the two components, so the gap for the non-electrostatic and the KQEQ for the electrostatic simultaneously, and let basically the, uh, you know, the, the regression decide how these things should be weighted. Um, and then you get a correct asymptotic behavior. So these are again water clusters that we are kind of slowly expanding. Uh, and, and here, I don't even know if black is KQEQ or red, uh, but anyways, the agreement with DFT is quite good here um, and the asymptotic behavior is correct. Okay, good. So that's, that's all I have for today. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, my, my summary is, you know, basically I think um, the, including this, this electronic structure information is, is very nice because we can make more data efficient models because we're not learning the whole chunk, but only the things that, that we, we want to approximate. Um, and, and, and it overcomes kind of this locality issue in a, in a uh, kind of physically motivated way. And we have kind of two versions of that. One is the, the DFT, which is the full thing that gets to the full electron density. Um, and the other is the, the charge equilibration, which is a much, much cheaper model uh, that nonetheless gets you uh, kind of the most important aspects of electrostatics and uh, charge distributions. Yeah. So uh, thanks to, to everyone who was working on this um, and, and, and funding and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting, these uh, machine learning electron densities. So, 
just a quick question like what is the largest system or most complicated system that you have tested this this method um so so for the kernel dft we've only done it for mole molecules or, or molecular clusters so i think the largest thing was like something yeah uh, um, so these these uh, octane and then we did different alcohols and, and things like that so organic molecules small organic molecules basically um for the kernel charge equilibration um, we've done bigger things like uh, you know zinc oxide nanoparticles, so hundreds of atoms. Um, but it's we are it's it's a little bit of a, in a in a prototype phase yet at the moment. Um, so the big thing that is missing for for many of the applications we want to do is uh, periodic boundary conditions. Uh, so this is something we're working on. Um, but it's like I mean in principle you know the, the, this is no more expensive than doing normal QEQ, and in lamps you can do normal QEQ for thousands of atoms easily. So kind of we know. How efficient it can be, but our version is not as efficient as it can be. Hey, uh, great talk! Thanks a lot. The, you didn't come back to the the H two example, the stretched H two, right? So, mm -hmm. are the I'm trying to understand the current new kernel functions you introduced? Are yeah. they then non-zero when when H two is stretched? Because the the overlap of the atomic densities is still zero in the middle, right? So yeah, where you would have that bump in the the density in the sorry the energy density. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's it's a little bit of a of a question of um, so okay. Uh, so we we actually didn't do it numerically, but um, uh, ah, too many slides. Too many slides. Yeah. So here it is. So um, okay. So the thing is, in 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 the the new model, we are building um, a descriptor based on on kind of the density here and the density here, yeah. right? Um, and uh, this, this is, becomes constant as, as the molecule stretches. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Um, so our model will predict a constant density for in this limit, uh, constant energy in this limit, sorry, because the descriptors are no longer changing as we go, uh, go yeah. longer and longer. So if we train on this point and on this point, it will do the right thing, basically. Um, yeah. So it has, it has I think this is one of the advantages. It does have nice uh, kind of dissociation uh, asymptotic properties, yeah. but you need to put kind of the asymptotic points into the training. Yeah, okay. I mean, that you have to do in any case. Yeah. And I mean, and that's, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, this H2 problem is, is, is a, a can of worms, as you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, there are, and it's, it's, it, to me, it's, it's even uh, an interesting question what the right answer should be, right? Because in, you know, so in Hartree Fock, okay, you have, you have basically you have this, this curve here that goes to a different limit than, than uh, the gray one here, okay? And the gray one goes to the right limit. That's a uh, broken symmetry Hartree Fock. That's when you do kind of you, you, yeah. you, you cheat uh, yourself out of this problem by putting one spin up here and one spin down, down here or the other way around. Um, and that's kind of the DFT way of doing this problem. Right, so if, you, if I do this calculation with, with uh, PBE or something, then typically I would do this symmetry breaking thing and I would get to the right limit. Um, and our models definitely do that. But since we're kind of emulating wave function methods, it's a question whether they shouldn't behave more like wave function methods. In that case, like if I do, um, you know, closed child couple cluster, open child couple cluster, they go to the same limit. Hmm. And I, I've, I have not thought about this thoroughly enough to give you a good answer, but it's a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's one question from the chat. Uh, can this method deal with excited states or distinguish between geometric or spin isomers or a, of any molecule and slash system? So what is this, the second part? Uh, if it can distinguish between uh, spin isomers. Um, yeah, so we, we don't have a, um, a spin polarized version of it. Um, but but the, it's it's uh, in principle trivial to uh, to extend. I mean, so this is just means that if you do spin density functional theory, you have two densities instead of one, and then you expand both of them and and build the model based on both coefficients. So um, excited states we haven't done anything on. And again, I'm I'm not a big fan of or well not not even a, it, it doesn't matter whether, whether I'm a fan or not. I'm not an expert at all on time dependent density functional theory, um, and I don't plan to, to do this. I think this is not my expertise. So I'm, we, are, we are really focusing on ground-based stuff.
Uh, hello, uh, and uh, thank you for the nice talk. I have a question about the electronegativity that uh, you introduce it as a function of the uh, kernel. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just uh, wondering, what does it mean exactly? You mean that it's uh, you introduce kernel as a propagator from some point to another, or it's uh, just... no? I mean, uh, so what, what I mean is that basically um, the 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 electronegativity is well defined for an isolated atom, right? So you yeah. can do like the Mulliken thing, yeah. Um, and but if I use that electronegativity of the isolated atom to build my charge calibration model, it doesn't really for, um, reproduce the charge distribution in the molecule well, okay? And and the way that 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 we rationalize this is that the electronegativity of an atom in a molecule is not the same as of the isolated atom. So we need to make it respond to the environment, right? Um, and so the, 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 the kernel is simply um, uh, a, a, a way for us to, um, to quantify or, or to, to, to exert this influence of the environment on the electronegativity. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and can you specify exactly a little bit how you introduce this exactly, the, the, the effect of the environment? If you... Yeah, yeah, so, so, so it's, um, um, so, this is again pretty pretty analogous to the way interatomic potentials work. So in interatomic potentials, you have a global property, the energy, um, and and you describe it by these local energy contributions, and the regression model learns what these local energy contributions are, and you sum them up, and they they turn into the um, total energy. And and these things are they are kind of fictitious, so you don't need to define them. You don't need to know what the local atomic energy is. The model discovers this by itself. So this is just uh, the freedom we give to the regression model to say, you don't have to use a fixed um, electronegativity for each, uh, each element, you can make it adapt. And then the, the model does this adapting for us. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.